Hi, I'm Daniel Nyman. On behalf of the Forum for Healthcare Strategists, as well as our colleagues at Salesforce, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We're looking forward to a timely discussion on turn big data into big revenue using AI automation and digital transformation. By radically improving patient access, engagement, and outcomes, Banner Health is driving millions of dollars of additional revenue each year. Today, we're joined by Brock Bassetti and Chris Pace from Banner Health and Ben Saden from Salesforce, who will dive down the innovations driving the growth. We'll hear about Banner Health's intelligent digital front door, centralized contact center, and personalized messaging platform, all of which are built on large data models and leverage advanced AI technologies. One note before we begin, if you'd like to ask our speakers a question, please enter it into the question and answer pane located on the bottom of your screen at any time. Brock, Chris, and Ben will respond to as many questions as they can in the time we have. With that, I'll turn the program over to Ben to start us off. Ben? Thanks so much, Daniel. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, it is so good to uh, be with you on this Tuesday morning. Um, I trust that you're having a great start to your week and that you're really uh, revolutionizing patient experiences while at the same time focusing on how to turn that big data into big revenue. I'm super excited to have this conversation with um, the what I call the Banner Boys, uh, Chris and Brock. Uh, they're doing some amazing things out in Arizona. Um, and uh, I'm excited to present that, allow them to present their story and how, um, how they're seeing some really great success uh, that hopefully will inspire you, inspire you to uh, take on uh, that mantle and uh, look for how you can uh, maybe even lead some digital transformation uh, in your neck of the woods. Again, my name is Ben Seiden, and um, I'm sort of a, a recovering healthcare marketer. Um, my background is having stood up the uh, digital marketing and Salesforce practice at a 15 hospital healthcare system uh, in the Midwest. And now I get to go talk to some of the most amazing healthcare marketers in the space, including Chris and Brock, and uh, really uh, help. Uh, I like to learn from them and then uh, help them learn from others. Uh, and so we're going to do that here this morning. Um, as always, if you're part of a, a healthcare or sorry, a part of a Salesforce uh, discussion, we're always going to share with you uh, this forward looking statement. We like to call it the love letter from our lawyers. Basically, it says, Look, we are a publicly traded company and any buying decision should be made based on what's currently available in the market, uh, including uh, and everything we're talking about today is included in that. At Salesforce, we also like to start by saying thank you and uh, really fantastic uh, that the people who are on this call are still on the front lines, still making amazing things happen, and we're so thankful for you. And we're grateful to be a part of healthcare. Uh, we've been in, um, in the healthcare space for 20 plus years. We serve some of the largest healthcare organizations out there. Uh, we are the third largest software company globally, uh, and we take great pride in that. We take great pride in the fact that trust is our number one value, especially in the midst of um, in increasing um, uh, compliance uh, regulations regarding um, healthcare uh, in the space of lots of different uh, things taking place uh, regarding um, hackers and, and that kind of stuff. We're super excited to be an organization that prides ourselves on trust, that, that puts that trust and that innovation and our customer success at the forefront of everything that we do. But we also know that healthcare marketers uh, have a unique set of things that they have to worry about. We talk about what keeps healthcare marketers awake at night. Uh, in my mind, it's it's three things. It's prioritizing compliance, making sure that the things that we're doing, the ways that we're um, using data, the ways that we're communicating with people is compliant. It, it's it's um, taking that security piece and, and putting it at the forefront of everything the healthcare marketer is doing. And harnessing data. If you've ever heard me talk, you talk about how you hear me talk about how much data we have in healthcare, and that we have. You, you're going to hear it again. Scrooge McDuck levels of data, where we can dive into all of those gold coins of data. But what are we doing with that? Is it just sitting there, or are we investing in it? Are we investing that data to make patient experiences better, to improve experiences, improve outcomes, improve uh, health uh, journeys? 
Um, and then how are we driving revenue? A, a lot of times there are various different uh, places where people are, are are trying to find their um, you know the, what's most important to them. It might be um, <clears throat> that they really want to be published, or it might be that they really want to make sure that that their particular piece of the hospital looks good, right? Maybe it's that oncology center or that orthopedic clinic. They really want to make sure that their one piece and the 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 marketer has to drive revenue. That's it. Everything has to be focused on driving revenue. A few years ago, Medicare came out with a, a statement that uh, with a report that basically said, at this point, um, each uh, healthcare life is roughly worth one and a half million dollars. So the healthcare marketers' sole responsibility, whether it be placing a billboard or placing an ad on Disney Plus or wherever you're placing it that that ad is driving revenue, right? Like we need to be solely focused on that because other people aren't. Other people are focused on their own uh, initiatives. And so we as healthcare marketers, we need to be focused on driving revenue. So prioritizing compliance, harnessing data and driving revenue. And really it's it's finding that that delta, that delta of, of healthcare where um, we have patient care, we have profitability, we have engagement, all of those things finding themselves at the center of what we're doing. There is a delta in healthcare. And um, I love that we're going to hear from Banner Health today because I feel like they're finding that delta. They're finding that place where, yeah, we are profitable. We are delivering good patient experiences, which equals good patient care. And we're we're engaging with our pe people well. You know, there's a, a healthcare system in Chicago, and I love this tagline. Um, we treat you like the most important patient we've ever had because you are. That is such a great tagline. Whoever came up with that, kudos to them, right? Like give them a raise. That is fantastic. But that's also a brand promise that the engagement team has the responsibility to keep, right? So how are we making sure that those individuals that we just told on a TV ad or on a billboard or wherever it is, how are we making sure that we're delivering on that brand promise with that personalized care, with that um, individualized engagement that all is, is uh, delivering profitability? So we're going to start with our conversation with, with, uh, with Chris. Chris is going to take uh, the the um, the spot here, uh, the spotlight here, uh, in just a moment. But we know that consumers, that patients, want a strong digital presence. Sixty three percent of consumers will choose one provider, one healthcare provider, over another because of a good online presence, because they have a good experience, because maybe they can schedule online or or maybe at least they don't get lost when they get to the website, right? That when I get to the to that digital experience, it makes sense to me. It's a good experience. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to my friend Chris um, there in uh, Arizona. He's going to tell you a little bit about Banner Health, and then he's going to talk about how the Banner team prioritizes uh, holding open that beautiful digital front door. Chris? All right. Thanks, Ben. So Banner Health, for those that haven't heard of us, we're, uh, we're based and headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we're a big, complex organization that covers everything from academic medicine down to urgent care, primary care. Um, we also own an insurance product. Uh, we have joint ventures with uh, with Aetna, and and you know we also offer a number of government uh, insurance programs. So if you think of you know the scale, you know we're about sixteen billion revenue uh, projected this year. Uh, Fourteen billion was what we showed in twenty twenty three. We have fifty five thousand employees. So um, with that, there's a lot of uh, you know stakeholders and and uh, you know, opinions about how, how things should be executed and, you know, what we, what we really pride ourselves in. And, um, this is why I just enjoy working with Brock on this, this effort is it's a highly collaborative and, and partner driven organization. And I think you have to be, um, you know, when you're, 
running across six states and have that large of a footprint, um, you know, we have to be coordinated in order to deliver to those high expectations that consumers have. So um, you can see our mission statement up there at the top, making healthcare easier so life can be better. That's really the summation of our strategy is where can we find points that are difficult and make them easier so that the experience is better. And I think that's where Digital Front Door was sort of born from. So if we jump to the next slide, we can walk through kind of the, the story here. So in 2017, um, and actually it, it, I, I started Banner in 2018. So some of this is uh, you know predating um, me. Brock was around in a different department. So, uh, but the way this was born was around some conversations that were happening at SLT and our board level to just talk about, hey, let's figure out all these different difficult points in the consumer journey and patient journey and address them. And so, you know, put simply in this illustration, we started with digital front door, but it's, you have to think of it as a continuum. It's how do we get people in easy? How do we serve their needs efficiently? And then how do we engage with them optimally? And through all that, it's a number of different facets that you have to navigate this through consumers, which are basically before the doctor appointment, you know, those are the folks that we're trying to acquire in the attention economy with marketing messaging, the patient, which is, you know, when the door closes and the doc is in the exam room to when the doc leaves the exam room and you have your discharge uh, information to move forward. We have members, which are part of our insurance products that we uh, offer. We have the research that, that looks at not only, you know, in the care delivery side, you know, how can we, um, you know, because we have academic medicine, you know, looking at research in that regard, but also looking at research when it comes to customer behaviors and customer acquisition and funnels and all that, that cool stuff that digital marketers drool over. And then of course we have our providers. Uh, Banner has thousands of doctors that we employ and tens of thousands that we engage with in our community. So having all of that information housed in a centralized data repository that is then able to be democratized up to those three facets of our digital front door and omni-channel experience is, is really paramount. This is the, the oxygen that fuels the, the sort of the flame that, that allows us to reach everybody with uh, unified messaging. So if we jump to the next slide, um, we can talk a little bit about you know, the, the how we start piece. So in 2018, we drove in heavy with our, our front door experience. And this was really around, you know, improving our website. We had dozens of web experiences back then that represented hospital, hospital brochures about the company, recruiting, that type of stuff. And it was, it was kind of all over the place. It was super fragmented. It's difficult to navigate. And I think most importantly, Google couldn't know one end from the other. So when we worked on Digital Front Door, we consolidated everything into one web experience. And the, it, it, the data shows it worked. We had 7 million visits to our website in 2018. Last year, we had 65 million. So you, know, you don't get there through just collapsing and consolidating. You also have to be super intentional on what it is you're delivering, having a strong content and SEO strategy, um, and and using technology to where it's best applied. Um, one problem we had to solve through digital front door, we go back to the next slide, sorry, I'll, I'll just wrap this one up real quick. Um, so, you know, we had 5,000, 6,000 pages of content that were in English, but the Phoenix market in Tucson are over 30%, 40% Hispanic. A large portion of those speak Spanish first as their language, and we want to meet people where they are. So what did we do? You know, we had two choices, go with human translation. I think the price tag was about one and a half million to go that route. Um, and then the day we launched it, it would have been obsolete because web content changes, right? So the other option was we could work with partners to be able to translate on the fly. So we we talked to Google. They had a cool opportunity for us to do sort of a LLM approach to 
content translation using their translation API. So in a matter of moments, we had a fully translated web experience that keeps up to date as in English content is published, we're able to translate it and it shows up in SEO. So how did that affect the website? Spanish capture, Spanish language capture went from about one to 2% for the human translated content that we had to now we're about 20% consumed in Spanish now. So that's, that's one way to do it. The other thing is really focusing on those content. I mean, I'm sorry, those conversion opportunities. So we're generating 500,000 booked appointments through our various touch points there. We also have a, an AI assisted uh, capability called Get Care Now. I think a lot of organizations have a, tr a triage tool, if you will. Um, but this is this was intended to de-escalate where care was not needed at the high level that people thought that it would be needed. So somebody comes in thinking they need an ER visit when in fact they could have probably self care or um, urgent care um, solved their issue. So making sure that we're addressing those concerns easily without having people to pick up a phone was super important. Um, so if we jump to the next slide, um, you know, this is really, you know, how we thought it through. So, you know, data can be your guide to almost anything, um, especially in strategy and particularly in marketing. So really understanding what the patient or what the consumer wants is first and foremost, because, you know, let's be honest, no, not many people really want to engage with their health system unless they need us. And so you have to be relevant when relevancy matters. So understanding what those journeys are, understanding what content matters at which channel when is important, and, and then capturing information about your customers so that you can service them better. Um, Brock's team has done a brilliant job in stitching together a database where we now have 8 million contacts that we're able to connect with in various channels and uh, provide them personalized information that matters most to them in those uh, points in their journey. We also are sending a lot of email out uh, as part of the strategy. So uh, in 2023, we sent out 60 million emails at a 40% open rate, which meant that 25 million sets of eyeballs saw our content and did, and then had the opportunity to do something with it. So that relevant content is super important because you know we want to not only look at the landscape of what pulls people into the website, but then also using some of those similar insights, you know, curiosity is something that, you know, sort of pervades throughout the digital journey. So as people ask questions online, we're positioned to be able to address that with content marketing and then push it uh, in the relevant channels to reach those people that have signed up for what they're uh, waiting for. And, and our blog strategy was really central to this. Back in 2018, we had 300,000 visits to a blog that maybe saw one or two posts published a, a month. And now we're publishing 30 posts a month with our own content experts. We're not using AI to do this. This is all human written content. And we are uh, we let, uh, landed at about 24 million visits, or that's what we're projected to this year, 20 million last year. So going from that delta of 30,000 to 20 plus million is really another sort of baseline fact that shows that when you use data as a guide, success is bred from that. Um, technology is the third uh, third rail here because you know you can invest in a lot of technology. And I think a lot of health systems are sitting on a mountain of shelfware that is just not being used. But what we're really you know tightly connected with our IT teams and our digital partners across the organization on is investing in the right technology that is best applied to our strategy. So building out an app that's homegrown that allows us to have full control over that experience is important. Um, generating revenue and labor savings off of self-service, uh, we're able to calculate that. So we estimate, and we'll get into the numbers in a minute, but $7.5 million delta in revenue generation and labor savings means that we can do more to serve the customers in those channels where it's a little bit more complex, needs a lot more human interaction. And you can see the numbers on the screen there. Um, that's that's where that 500,000 plus self-served customers comes from. And, and we continue to refine this process so that ultimately 
we think that more than half of our business can come through self-service. So jumping into the next slide, um, you know, essentially AI is kind of the next thing that will help not only optimize our, our experiences, but look at, you know, how can we leverage this data and, and deliver more information that's relevant without as much, you know, potential waste. So that 40% open rate is one example, you know, with, with AI, you know, theoretically you could improve upon that because the content will be even more hyper relevant to those journeys because we'll know more about where those folks are in their journeys. You know, looking at our web properties, making sure that it's optimized toward consumer behavior, making sure that it's adaptable. Um, you know, we have a six state footprint. We can't always talk about cactus and palm trees and sunshine all the time uh, because, you know, folks in Wyoming might not ever see that. I mean, you know, there, I, I, I don't know if you've been to Wyoming, but there aren't many of um, cacti and palm trees. And usually when there's sun and cool weather here, it's still snowing or windy or raining or whatever in the, in the plains. So we want to make sure that not only is our content relevant to consumers, but even the way we present it, including imagery, um, it, it, it makes a lot of sense when it's, when it's highly uh, personalized and and geo-targeted so that it feels like it looks like where uh, everybody is at the same time. Language is another thing. You know, Arizona is a rapidly growing market. Market. You know, I mentioned the the percentage of Spanish-speaking population, but we have large communities of, um, you know, Native American population. We have uh, um, a large group of folks moving in from Taiwan because uh, there's just a massive semiconductor presence in the Phoenix area. So overnight we went from, you know, like just a baseline of, of uh, folks that spoke, um, you know, simplified Chinese uh, language to now it's, you know, 100,000 plus potentially in our market. So being prepared to meet those folks needs with, with the language that's in their, um, in, in the language they want to speak is really important. Um, you know, I, I'll skip over the Gen AI piece because I, I think I address that, but, you know, this is the other piece that Brock's team has been really working hard on, and that's the um, autonomous call deflection. So making sure that, you know, we're able to implement symptom checker prompts throughout the journey, including chatbot, including, you know, even voice AI, so that it's less lift on the call center agent and is able to direct those calls to the right uh, the right agent with the right skill set so that they can address that customer's needs as quickly as possible. And that's where some of the cost savings come in. So I'll pass it back to Ben because um, he's going to transition us to, over to Brock. I mean, the stuff that you are putting together, Chris, is absolutely fantastic. Um, to be able to, uh, what, what what we used to call in, in college are to, to speak to somebody in their heart language, right? Like that is phenomenal here in the Chicago area. Um, it would be Spanish, but it would also be Polish, right? Like there's so many different uh, languages in the U S that it makes sense for um, us to dive into that and really make sure that we're, we're meeting people where they are providing that experience uh, the way that they want it to be, uh, provided and ultimately making sure that it's a seamless experience. 51% uh, of U.S. patients said that they're satisfied with their provider's call center service. That's a pretty low number, right? Like we're not doing a great job of uh, making sure that people, when they reach out to us and when they uh, have that conversation around uh, scheduling an appointment, around uh, finding a new physician, whatever the case might be, we're not doing a great job of making that a seamless um, experience. And I know, Chris, you you did a fantastic job of of uh, sort of teeing uh, Brock up to be able to say, hey, look, we want to even use our chat bot to um, deflect that call to the right person, right? Um, to the uh, individual that uh, can best uh, help them um, with whatever they're looking for. So, Brock, I know you and your team are tirelessly working on uh, improving the uh, the one-on-one -on -one experience between that call center rep 
and the patient. Um, why don't you walk us through uh, the sort of the process you've taken, where you found uh, the, the difficulties and uh, how, how you've come through on the other side? <clears throat> Sounds great. So um, as, as you saw, Chris and the digital marketing team have done an amazing job driving leads, driving qualified leads, driving wonderful patients in the market, well, well insured patients to our system. Um, the problem was, is sometimes, uh, and we sometimes, we continue to do so, the operations, the digital front door leads to an operational brick wall. Um, the phones ring, nobody answers. Um, sometimes driving, often driving to low, we have low cost per leads, but really high cost for a conversion. So um, the patients are coming, the patients are there, there's demand, but we're not able to convert them. And the question became, why? Why are we not able to convert all these people into our system? <clears throat> what we found, one of many reasons, but one reason that was the probably the driving reason was decentralized clinic scheduling provided an inconsistent, uh, unreliable phone experience. <clears throat> While, while Chris might have 65 million uh, digital conversions, the next phase in the funnel is, is 12 million phone calls. Um, we have much fewer phone calls than we have actual clinic encounters. So this funnel really is shaped um, downward. And by not addressing the phone channel and uh, prioritizing it, we were creating a bottleneck in the funnel. So great top, top of funnel, a pinch point at the phone center, empty physicians wondering where are the leads coming from? Where are the patients? Well, they were coming, but they were getting pinched out um, in the process. Other things, scaling a unified call center was a challenge due to complexity and physician trust. Also, EMRs are not call center systems. Um, they, they just are not, and that is okay. Um, so the answer to the solution um, on the next slide was what we call one banner. So we actually branded our Salesforce environment. We use Salesforce in a, a variety of different ways. We wanted to separate our Salesforce instance for a call center platform. One banner, we're one team. And um, we have 900 call center agents in general. We have uh, about 500 of them, 450 of them using Salesforce. We answer the call, all the calls for the doctor's office. You cannot call the doctor's office. Um, in scenarios where we've tried to have the doctor's office answer calls, they do not prioritize the phone. If you've ever been in a doctor's office and you're sitting in the in the line at the front, you hear the uh, please hold, put it back on 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 the desk, and they'll continue talking to you. You're the person in the building. That's where they will prioritize, and they will never prioritize um, the phone channel as much uh, because it's not their business. <clears throat> the business is patient care. So. Creating, creating this, this intelligent contact center platform was a challenge um, that was solved by data. So we pulled all the data together from the EMRs, from the different various systems. We have multiple EMRs, pulled it all together. We built integrations with those EMRs, full integrations, and we're able to follow this process like I outlined below. So the patient calls in and our Genesis Cloud CCAS screen pops into, um, into Salesforce, bringing the patient who's calling to the forefront of the, the agent screen. <clears throat> the agent can, three, three, can see a relevant 360 in the single pane of glass. Again, EMRs are not contact center systems. We have pulled all the data from the different various points of the different EMRs into a single pane of glass for the, what's most relevant to the contact center agent. <clears throat> Beyond that, um, contact center agents make between $15 and $20 per hour. They could and they're 25% turnover. So highly likely that your call to the contact center agent you are talking to two weeks ago worked at Target or two weeks ago worked for State Farm on a different call center, or maybe they um, you know, worked at a restaurant. That's the kind of labor pool we're pooling for. We're looking for people with excellent customer service and critical thinking, um, yet they have a lot of options. And so they can work anywhere. What we, that means is that we need to make the process extremely simple and the person on the phone needs to basically read the scripts off of the screen. Um, the system should guide the conversation for the most part. So what we built was um, with a couple of partners, MedChat and Isabel, we built an agent assist bot to triage the symptoms. Patient calls in, they could tell you that they're bleeding, their baby's not breathing, they're thinking about um, 
They're thinking about all kinds of things. They have chest pain. And again, you were in the restaurant industry or the retail industry, or maybe in the financial industry just a couple of weeks ago. Now you're taking calls. Very, very critical things. Um, a lot of people will say a lot of weird things on healthcare calls. Um, and it's great to listen to sometimes. But so we built a, a, a agent assist bot. Um, it triages the symptoms. It tells the, the agent what to do, what to say, what are the follow-up questions? How severe is the chest pain plus headache plus nausea plus um, previous uh, heart condition? How serious of an issue is that? By the way, that's a serious issue. The agents are probably telling the, the patient they need to go to the emergency room, uh, which does happen. <clears throat> the agent, uh, once once the severity is, is handled and the agent has gone through kind of the safety steps, they're guided through a scheduling workbook. Picking the right provider is very difficult. Um, you know, another example that comes up often in primary care and, and even more in specialty is let's say you have a child who is maybe in the fifth grade who may have an autism, ADHD, or other kind of disability or or or, um, or other condition that might need a special program, and you might need a form in order to get into that special program. So you need to find, you want to talk to your pediatrician and pediatrician will, will take care of that form. <clears throat> well, not every physician might know how to do that form and how to um, handle uh, different, different conditions on the autism spectrum or ADHD conditions or other kind of scenarios in, in uh, mental health. And so that provider might, you might come to that provider visit and be frustrated because you didn't get your, your need met that you waited possibly two to three weeks to get in. So in order to find the right provider for the right patient is, is really critical on the phone. <clears throat> Once that match is made, the patient is then scheduled into the EMR. So the data from Salesforce flows into the EMR, fills in all the fields. The patient, the agent does not need to go into the EMR for any reason. And then afterwards, uh, Salesforce Einstein recommends all the other offerings that might help that patient be their healthiest um, next best action other care needs and other gaps and might need so that that child who you know needs an adhd evaluation to get into a special program at school might also have a care gap in his or for her uh, wellness annual or yearly wellness exam for their 11 year old visit so this platform helps us so that really we can get people onto the phones faster any agent can take any call for any physician. It doesn't matter the specialty or the um, region or the city because all of the process and all the steps are there for, for the agent. And we're able to really take it use of the economy of scale. And Brock, real quick, I just want to call out one one piece I think is really important in what you're saying. And, and we we for everybody that wasn't at HMPS, we did present this live once. And the question was, do your uh, agents have to swivel chair? Like, do they go back and forth between screens or um, at Banner Health in the one banner system? Are they are your call center reps able to do everything they need to do in uh, the Salesforce platform or do they have to go back and forth between Cerner? Yeah. At the beginning, we um, this did take us a little bit of time to build but we now have the agents completely in Salesforce and they do not need to access the EMR or the other platforms to schedule to um, or to complete any actions. Everything is able to be done on a Chrome browser, which is also very helpful um, for our patients, our agents who work from home in a variety of states. Um, we have a lot of agents dialing in from the Midwest and, and other places in the country. So that has been did take a, a lot of work, a lot of design, and a lot of investigation into the APIs of the EMRs and understanding that. And so it, it is definitely possible. There's an e API for all the needed flows and all of the need to work. Need to work. <clears throat> so this, as you can imagine at our scale, um, we have been able to decrease the number of agents we have while increasing the number of providers that we support. So Banner Health, Banner Medical Group, Banner University Medical Group has grown and we've added doctors, we've added specialists, we've added primary care doctors, we've added a ton more calls. Our abandonment rate has gone down. Um, before, uh, like I said, the phone would ring, nobody would answer. 10% abandonment call rate. 
is well above the industry standard. Now we're looking at maybe our bend and call rate's a little too good. And we're actually looking at um, reducing our staff even further to get closer to that three to 5% that uh, our leadership seems to be is comfortable with at the moment. This is this results in, in major savings. Um, if we had as many agents, the ratio between agents and providers we had when we started, if we had that same um, ratio, we would have to spend nine more, nine million more per year in order to meet the the call demand. The that labor saving is is hard savings right to the bottom line. In addition, we're able to schedule more accurately. So because of our tools, we have appointments that patients actually want and they're actually going to show up for. So our cancels and no-shows are are much less. And we're able to become a revenue generating center by adding on additional appointments that uh, the patient might not have known they need, but we were able to recommend that because of our data and our tools. <clears throat> and then biggest of all, um, the revenue. When you spend money on marketing and then people call and then they don't answer, then you don't get the revenue. Um, so by increase, decreasing our abandonment call rate, we're able to capture all those extra revenue. Um, the, the, the appointments that, that Chris and the digital marketing team are trying to promote are high dollar service lines, bariatric surgeries, orthopedic, um, spinal surgeries, these, these surgeries that bring in a lot of revenue. And by, by answering the call and completing those transactions, we're able to guide the patient through the entire process holistically all the way until they arrive in the clinic. So 24 million per year in, in impact, and this is growing as, as we expand into other states, we become more robust and better in our process. <clears throat> where we wanna go next is really, and I say where we want to go, where we are going, we are actively working on this, is creating the contact, the AI contact center of the future. So a lot of things we can do with generative AI, the sort of things we have in the work with some of our um, partners in the, our AI partners in the company. One thing we you have to worry about because we are using PHI, we can't just turn our data loose to chat GPT. Um, that is not a HIPAA compliant scenario. So we have to build our own infrastructure inside our own servers that can handle um, our data and connect um, artificial intelligence to our scenarios. So imagine you um, you open up a patient record and there's a summary already at the top of the last three or four times and things that Chris Pace has called in about, that Ben has called in about. You're speeding up the call. You're giving next, next, vi rec next visit recommendations and you're automating the note taking and getting even better data into the system. The, the big win and missing gap here in, in the AI call center is what you might call chain of thought conversation. So um, the thinking in the brain of scheduling is really about matching the patient's needs, their symptoms, their insurances to the right doctor. I have all these inputs. I need an output. Um, depending on the inputs that were given, you might need better inputs. Um, I say, I'm not feeling so good. Okay. What, what, you know, what is, what's not feeling good? What is going on with you? What is, what are your needs? What, tell me more about you. Um, to have that conversation. And then there is a future um, not too far off where for simple and transactional uh, conversations, a bot, um, whether it be a voice bot or chat bot, could provide a equivalent or better service than humans. 24-7, um, seven days a week, middle of the night, your baby is sick and uh, crying and you're a new parent and it's 2 a.m. on Saturday night. Um, you can get that care quickly. You can get your needs met. You can get those transactions completed. So that is where we are going to next. Yeah, that's great. And that is indeed data-driven revenue, right? Like that is you saying, we know what the issues are. We Our abandon rate was too high. We were, our, our, our marketing team was driving the right leads. We just weren't converting them, right? And so we're we're able to take that data and put our money where our data is, right? And say, we this is where we need to fix. This is the problem we need to solve. Um, and it, we're not just guessing at it. We're not just throwing a dart. Um, and we know that part of the the um, 
the patient experience is they want that personalized, individualized engagement. You know, we're in healthcare, people coming out of COVID are less, um, you know, willing to just say, yeah, I'll go to the doctor when I when I get sick. Now we they want to be more uh, of a partner with their provider in their health journey. They really want people to somebody to say, "Hey, this is what's next for you. This is where you should go." So guide me, um, work with me, help me to uh, do a better job of taking care of uh, my health and uh, being um, being in a in a better spot physically. So, um, Brock, I'll turn it back over to you. Why don't you kind of talk through how you and your team uh, and and Chris are thinking about uh, this engagement, uh, patient engagement priority? Yeah. So, you know, there's really three reasons to engage with somebody digitally, whether it be via a text message, an email, or um, some kind of notification. So we have, we have simplified our strategy into three steps, guide, nudge, and transact. Uh, guide, I'm Banner Health brand strategy is to be the wise guide. Um, we're providing you information. You are the hero of the story. We are here to help you with information, with blogs, with posts, with, in, with uh, data, with um, stories that will resonate with you. Beyond, then from there, um, we'll, once we have that trust, we will nudge patients, um, educate her, direct her compliantly in a scenario where she needs to take action. Um, and then beyond that, sometimes it's just we need to provide that trust with transactional information that is needed in order to finish the task. <clears throat> the way that this that that looks really simple, <laughs> having three 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 engagement strategies, but in order to make that happen, there's an incredible amount of data um, engaged in being able to deliver that scenario. And this is really all built on top of the Salesforce platforms. What we all want to do as marketers, operations folks, is deliver that perfect engagement that's going to change the trajectory of someone's healthcare. Um, I delivered, a, you know, this message was the message that helped Ben get the care he needed to live a better life. Um, maybe that's a little over dramatic, but there's a lot of opportunities to make a difference. So getting the right message at the right time that makes the right impact. In order to deliver that, you need to know about your patient in order to deliver that personalized um, experience. So we have patient data, member data, consumer and social determinants of death data, uh, data from our emails, data from our call center, um, and, and actually quite a bit more than that. We combine that all into our Salesforce data ecosystem. And then we apply all the tools that are available in that scenario. Um, Salesforce AI, predictive analytics, propensity modeling, advanced segmentation, targeted care gaps, um, driving those journeys and really pulling all that together um, for that message. For, for the patient, it's one message. For us, it might be a logical flow of 45 steps and that that guide that that single message that will deliver and that delivers better experience better outcomes and and better margins and this the next slide i can share about how much oh, i'm sorry never mind i was off on a slide back up <clears throat> we, we 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 do uh drive a lot of of margins and a lot of of experience here in order to take that to the next step sorry ben you can go to the next slide there um from here, where we're working on next, thank you, you can go there. Um, the, the impact from the omni-channel engagement is we're able, is for, there on the right-hand side. So we're able to drive, um, we've been able to consolidate several vendors. We're able to reduce our no-show rate. Our no-show rate went from 14% to 12%. Um, it's a small, small change, but at a volume, that is a lot of revenue. The other thing about um, the engagement channel that really helps is by by sending the patient the right message at the right time, you avoid calls. People don't call in because they got the message they needed. Um, something as simple as sometimes um, you you have a referral and uh, you need you know you have this referral. You're waiting on the office to give you a referral. We text you with the referral that you need and cut the 
cut the call out where you're anxiously awaiting that referral and you call in asking if we have it yet. And then those, those there's a lot of revenue that can be attributed to those emails. <clears throat> Across the whole ecosystem, you can see driving data from the digital front door is driving revenue in calls avoided and driving and uh, new patient appointments. <clears throat> the contact center is saving saving money in labor savings and driving revenue by having higher conversions. And the omni-channel engagement is driving uh, revenue and saving money by um, avoiding calls. Altogether, it's bringing us $33 million of revenue and almost 11 million in cost savings with a total impact of, of $44 million. This is um, probably a conservative estimate on our on our impact. And in we've had, we've been able to gain a lot of traction and a lot of trust in the organization through all this work. Yeah, so as you can see, you know, going back to our, you know, one of our early slides here, um, you know, it was it was really an iterative journey to get from, you know, how we started conceptually and uh, addressing all these pain points to now harvesting real dollars at the end of this chain and it's it's ultimately supported by, you know, strong data foundation, um logical process improvement and working together collaboratively to address these problems at scale. I know uh, Brock's boss, uh, Chris Castellano says a statement, I hope I quote it right. It's, um, you know, it's, it's easy to, um, to solve problems, um, but when you have to solve them at scale, that's where things can go a little sideways. So, you know, it's really just a tackling um, and addressing those those challenges and getting them really refined so that you can do them well and then applying that into a scalable model so that it starts to you know have that uh, compounding effect over time. So as we save and harvest revenue, we're able to double down in certain areas and and drive to more efficiency, more optimization and uh, and ultimately more benefit to the organization and to our customers. Yeah, I love this story, Chris and Brock, because, uh, you know, I, I there's just what you just said kind of made me think of like a football team, right? Like sometimes your football team might invest really heavily into the offense and say, hey, we're just going to go and score a ton of points. And then the defense is like a sieve. And so you don't win a lot of games, right? Or opposite, you are really good defensively, but you don't score enough points to win, right? looks like you all have have been able to do both right you you've invested in the right places you're able to get a full team on the field that's really good if only the Arizona Cardinals could do that right if they could just say hey we're going to follow what Banner Health is doing and get a good team on both sides of the ball um but it feels like that's sort of where where you found that sweet spot is is that offensive and the defensive side of of the ball, the offensive being, hey, we're going to go do great marketing, and the defensive, hey, we're we're going to answer those calls. We're going to do a great job of of responding uh, when people reach out to us. Um, and, and basically, what you've been able to do is is sort of develop this unified way of seeing your patients. One of the things we've talked about, just um, you know, on the side with one another, is being able to know, hey, this is this is an individual. This is a, a person who is a caregiver for an elderly parent and for a child, right? Like it's not just a number. It's not just a patient that we see once a year or once every few years and then are able to um, deliver, you know, revenue because we we asked the insurance company to pay for that experience, right? We're, we're able to see who these individuals are and really deliver that a full throated experience to them. And I know Brock, um, one of the things, one of the questions that we've seen come through has been, or, well, let me go to Chris. Chris, you've talked about generative AI. Sometimes generative AI can sort of be a scary proposition. Um, are, is generative AI really going to steal everybody's jobs? Like how should we be thinking about it? How is Banner thinking about using generative AI for the marketing team? 
Yeah, it's a great question. It comes up a lot. And I think, you know, the answer is still um, a bit nebulous. Um, you know, we're, we're experimenting. I think that's really the best thing you can do as a leader is give your teams the ability to, to try things and, um, and learn to fail fast. So right now it's, it's more using generative AI tools. I, I mentioned the, um, the practical use case of, uh, generating content at scale, uh, in a translated capacity. So minimal risk. Um, in terms of nailing down voice and tone, we've tuned the model to match, but um, you know it's not going to hallucinate on us. Um, whereas, you know, if you're using Gen AI to write copy, I think what you need to think about is being able to harness the the sourcing of your your LLM LLM strategy and making sure you're applying it um, in a way that is matched up to your your voice and tone, and then have human oversight um, and governance around it. I think that's something that a lot of organizations right now in June of 2024 are trying to figure out and some are addressing. I know Banner is working on a lot of different areas in this space. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's really just one of these, like, you know, it's not a flash in the pan. Um, this is going to stick. It's not something that's going to take jobs, but it's going to change how you work. So, just giving your team the uh, the flexibility and the and the courage to try, I think, is really um, important as adoption of tools like Gen AI are are brought to the forefront and become part of our toolkit in marketing. Yeah, I've heard basically, you know, your Gen AI or any of this AI should really be aimed at you know, making those workers more productive, not replacing them, right? So making it so that they can do more, better, faster, um, as opposed to doing it instead of them, right? Um, and, and, and Brock, we had a question that actually came in um, on the, the Q&A. How do your patients or clients um, respond to not being able to actually call the doctor's office? Like are, how, how personalized are you able to get the answers for uh, the care that they're asking? <clears throat> yeah, I can. Um, so I'll answer in two ways. One, we do a really good job of actually making it. We kind of mask and hide the fact that we're a call center. So the intention is that you are calling Banner Health. We are inside Banner Health. Again, Banner Health is a thousand things to a thousand to not a thousand people to five million people. Um, and so delivering that personalized experience for the thing that they're calling about. Um, second, and this is a challenge for everyone in healthcare is oftentimes what they're actually looking for is access to their provider. And that's a challenge. Um, and that's a challenge we're looking to solve. They want free advice. They want instant answers. They want concierge medicine. And with Medicaid rates, they're often, we're barely squeaking by. Um, with the staffing ratios we have. So that is a challenge, I think, for, for healthcare going forward is how do we provide our doctors and our providers, every healthcare provider is totally burnt out and they spend hours a day responding to messages. The last thing they want is more messages and more calls. So how do we, how do, we do that? How do we um, use the tools, the technologies to give patients the care they need and protect our providers who, you know, are... Doctor, people are not entering medicine at the rate that people that we need them to, because it's not lucrative as anymore. It's not. It's a lot harder. Um, my wife is a clinician. She said I should have just been an engineer. You know, you sit in a desk all day and it's great. Um, she's out there taking care of people and she's tired. So you know, two part answer to that question. Yeah, and we know that um, every part of healthcare is having issues right now with getting enough staffing. So, um, and we also know that work is changing for good. And this is exactly what you all were talking about. Um, you know, and, and our on Einstein co-pilot here at Salesforce, uh, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is exactly what Chris was saying, doing the, the generative AI or allowing that co-pilot, but making sure there's human eyes on it before action is taken. Right. But how are we, um, able to, um, 
you know, deliver better experiences with unified data, um, making sure that action can be taken um, and in that flow that that is a natural workflow. Um, the last thing that I want to say, and then I'll turn it uh, back over to our incredible host, Daniel, is take a look at this. This is um, the, the Salesforce State of Marketing Report. Feel free to, to scan that. We'll also make sure that you have a copy of it uh, or link to it in the um, the email that we send uh, as a response or you know in, uh, after this. But um, we'd love for you to see what the, our report has, 4,850 people. Um, are were uh, asked uh, 4,850 marketers were asked about how they're utilizing data and AI, what their strategy is going to look like, and we'd love to to give you that free report uh, just for coming in and being a part of this session today. So thanks again so much. Uh, thank you for being on the front lines. Thank you for being uh, many of you for being customers and partners with Salesforce. Thank you to Brock and Chris for all of the uh, wonderful things you're doing to improve patient experiences, improve outcomes and improve profitability. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Daniel for some closing thoughts. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm sure I, the audience joins me in thanking you, Brock and Chris for that terrific presentation. And to all of you in our audience, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Please note that if you asked a question that we weren't able to get to, we'll do our best to get a response to you. We'll also be sending out a link to the webinar recording, so watch for that within the next few days. Finally, be sure to give us your feedback by completing the evaluation survey as you exit the webinar. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars and check the forum website at healthcarestrategy.com for details. And be on the lookout for information on the 2025 Healthcare Marketing and Physician Strategy Summit in Orlando, April 30th to May 2nd. We hope you'll join us for our 30th year. That concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.